Isabel Dedring is Global Transport Leader at Arup. From 2011 to 2016, she was Deputy Mayor for Transport in the Johnson administration. Now, NLA has just opened its exhibition on the changing face of London, which looks at London's development over the last 15 years. So Isabel, as Deputy Mayor, you oversaw the delivery of a transport strategy for the Olympics, which was a, a high point of that period of growth. Now, looking back, what, what were your key challenges and successes at, when you were Deputy Mayor? I guess looking back on it, you know, it was a much easier time, wasn't it? There was, a, you know, we didn't have COVID to contend with and, um, and we were sort of on a rising tide economically. So um, when you say challenges, I'm thinking now they weren't that challenging relative to, you know, the current situation. But I guess two things really for me personally, um, one of the things I tried to do was really put focus on, uh, you know, transport fundamentally should be invisible. It's not, people don't really want to, most people don't want to think about transport experience. It, it's an enabling device in the city. Um, and if we put the customer or the user at the heart of our thinking on transport, uh, then we'll design the right systems and the right policies. But a lot of the transport industry um, thinks about big pieces of kit and infrastructure. Uh, so when I came into the role, uh, the tube was not performing very well. There were uh, huge delays on the tube. And, you know, that's affecting people picking up their kids from school, getting into work on time. Um, and so we cut tube delays by a very significant percentage. You know, it's not, you can't point to something at the end of it and say, I built that. Um, but for me, it's much more important that what we're thinking about as transport professionals is, you know, the 8 million people in the city that are trying to get on with their with their day to day lives. So for me, that was, you know, one of the challenges was the industry itself is full of people who actually prefer to talk about things rather than people generally. Uh, and so that was something that I tried to um, shift a bit during the time that I was there. And I guess the other one really was um, the whole agenda around sort of progressive transport. So um, electric vehicles, lower emission vehicles and cycling. Uh, so we started the kind of bigger conversion into electric buses, which is now rolling forward um, the electric taxi um, and the segregated cycling facilities in London. And I guess, you know, it was, it was, it's funny looking back now because now it's all sort of rolling out and you know you see the electric taxis everywhere um, we're seeing all the segregated cycling infrastructure popping up left right and center but at that time you know we were fighting for every second on the traffic light timings uh, to protect pedestrians and cyclists and every meter of road was like incredibly hotly contested it sort of feels weird now looking back on it because uh, the, the sort of temperatures changed on all of that quite a lot Yes, well, as part of that change, I mean, the, the, the shift to greater focus on active travel, uh, Sadiq Khan has continued that, and that, of course, has been accelerated by the government's walking and cycling revolution, which it announced in July. Uh, but COVID safety issues with public transport has led to greater car use at the moment. So do you think we're really going to see a, a fundamental change in the way we use our streets at the moment? I think there's, sort of two, there's probably two dimensions to that. One is there was a lot of talk, do you remember early, early on during the pandemic and uh, people saying, you know, this is going to fundamentally transform how people move around cities. And, and uh, the history, you know, sort of human history doesn't relate that we, that that tends to happen. Um, you know, we, we tend to, you know, cities get disrupted, but then they carry on being cities and functioning in very similar ways. Um, in terms of the fundamental nature of, of, of the city and of how, how people move and the fact that people do move around the city. Um, I think there will be some, I think there's an opportunity as policymakers, as, you know, industry professionals for us to seize this chance to sort of shift people's behaviors, but it's going to be probably accelerating some changes that were happening anyway, it's not going to be a radical transformation in how people move. So is it going to help to get some people onto bikes that previously wouldn't have thought about it? Absolutely, yes. I mean, we all have colleagues who've, you know, bought their first bicycle, bought their first electric bicycle. So that, that's brilliant, but that's kind of accelerating a trend slightly more than maybe otherwise would have, would have happened. I think if you look back at sort of the history of transport disruption, uh, you know, when lines are shut, um, when people suddenly can't do what they were able to do before. When things are up and running again, you tend to see about a five to 10% shift from what was happening before. So, you know, if a 
rail line closes and then reopens, you'll have five to 10% of people that have found something better to do. Maybe they're not making the trip, maybe they're using a different mode of transport, but you don't see 50% change. But there will be this quite long period, um, you know, looking around the world in my current role at, you know, lots of cities, at different phases of the recovery. Uh, and you do see quite a protracted period of sort of 40 to 50% capacity um, on the transport networks in cities. So it's not bouncing straight back to 80, 90%. Um, it's kind of sitting at that sort of half full level. And I think it will be like that for a couple of years, but I do think it will revert to broadly what we saw before. But these long-term trends, the 20, 30, 50 year trends of people, you know, doing more active travel, getting on their bikes again, et cetera, that's gonna, it's going to accelerate uh, those trends and we are seeing that. Um, the other thing to say is I think the fundamental sort of business model of urban transport was already creaking at the seams. Um, so the rise of Uber and similar, you know, business models Dolls, um, has led to a, a drop in bus revenue in cities around the world, tube revenue, the rise in walking, cycling, again, having that impact. So the whole concept of public transport in cities being funded usually half through grant and half through fares is the typical kind of balance around the world. Um, different places are different, but broadly, that's the balance. Um, when you see declining fare revenue, that that the whole business model doesn't stack up anymore in the way that it did five, 10, 20 years ago. Um, so I think there's a really exciting, and, and COVID's obviously significantly accelerated that because fares have evaporated. So I think there's a really exciting opportunity to rethink the whole fundamental question of how we pay for urban transport and how, how it's funded, how it's supported, um, you know, how, how do we price across modes? Um, so, you know, does it make sense that car travel in most places is effectively free? And to the extent we pay for car travel, it doesn't go to the city, it goes to the national government. That doesn't make too much sense. Um, you know, walking and cycling is free. Maybe we should actually pay people to be walking and cycling. That's all doable now with the technology that we have. So a kind of multimodal view of transport, not just in terms of understanding movement from a policy perspective, but actually understanding it and using it from a pricing and a business model perspective. I think that's, there is an opportunity there now, whether we're all brave enough to really think about that is a is a different question. But in my view, we should be, you know, this is the time that we should be thinking about, you know, scary things like road pricing, but rebooting them into the modern urban app driven era um, in a way that, you know, if Amazon were running our urban transport systems, you better believe the pricing model and the business model wouldn't be the way it is today. And, and we need to be much more radical in thinking about that. And we will need to be because there isn't going to be a, a reversion to some happy norm 20 years ago uh, where everything was in balance financially. Well, I think both the mayor and the, the government are about to publish their report on uh, funding of TFL. So it'd be interesting to see what they say. Uh, but so what is your view of the current re relationship between City Hall and Whitehall over uh, the sort of management and funding of T TFL, because obviously um, Andrew Gilligan was uh, part of your team, wasn't he, in terms of delivering cycling, now on the board of TFL, and you have quite a few people in number 10 who were actually involved with running London uh, in the Johnson administration, but it's, a, it's quite a complex relationship, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think also, you know, it's not like there's some magic money tree somewhere, you know, with all of the situation we're confronting with COVID, you know, how, how are we going to get ourselves out of very significant financial, not just in transport, but obviously urban transport is the, you know, a prime example of a, a very difficult situation where it isn't, you know, well, that funding stream's dried up, but this other one, you know, is now coming you know, up the ranks and therefore it all balances out in the end. Um, I do think that there, this is, as I say, I think this is the time to think differently about how we're constructing the pie chart of how we stack up the funding uh, for transport. I think that's fundamental. I think the other thing that we really have not explored 
in general around the world, um, but London's an, a, a, another example of that, um, is, you know, other revenue streams for transport. So when we build new transport infrastructure, you know, that always leads to, you know, an increase in economic activity, it leads to increase in property values, uh, that's around, around the world, you see that almost every time uh, you put in transport investment, but almost none of that, usually none of it, is, is recouped back into the transport system. So, you know, the taxpayer, the fair payer makes this investment and the benefit all goes into the pockets of homeowners, commercial property developers, you know, large landowners, um, and that just, you know, fundamentally that from, you know, basic economic perspective, um, it doesn't feel like the right answer. Um, especially when you don't have the funding anymore to make those investments, is there a different way to think about that? And obviously London's made some, you know, big steps forward relative to other cities. Looking at this, Crossrail is a good example in terms of the funding model. Uh, the Northern Line extension is funded through this sort of model. And uh, we're seeing, you know, at Arab looking around the world, there's more, more interest in cities around the world in how how they can kind of much more actively use the kinds of tools that London started to deploy. Um, so I, I would be expecting to see, you know, well, if I were sitting uh, where Andrew's sitting, if I were sitting where, where government is, I'd be looking to have a lot more of that sort of uh, thinking and doing brought, brought into, uh, into London and indeed elsewhere. Um, other cities around the UK are in very similar boat. Um, and then the other thing is, I think we should be thinking about, um, you know, the rise, the, the balance between who's providing transport in the city previously was, you know, largely, it's either entirely private, your car, or entirely public, the, the I don't know, you know, the tube. Um, and this sort of rise in all of these, you know, shared cycle schemes, uh, ride sharing that are private companies, but arguably, delivering what we would consider to be primarily a public good, which is, uh, you know, moving people around the city. So, you know, they don't pay for any of the infrastructure that's provided. The, the punter pays for the service, but the, the provider doesn't pay TFL anything. Um, so I think that whole area needs to be looked at, not in a punitive sense, but just in a, you know, if we're going to see a lot more provision from these sorts of operators, there's got to be a different way to get them to be part of the ecosystem in paying for the transport that we want to see. And, uh, you know, uh, well, I, there's many ways you can construct that, um, but a kind of system where people pay a, a pittance for licensing, um, for example, probably isn't the right model going forward. Now, one of, one of the things you instigated uh, was the London Infrastructure Plan of, of 2050, which is a sort of a remarkable document to have in a political situation where the four years seems sort of maximum uh, that people are looking forward. Now, also, of course, Arab, where, where you're working now, has produced uh, various studies over recent years on what the world is going to be like in the middle of the century or guidance towards that. So. Uh, what do you think the sort of future scenarios for London are that we should be looking at in the light of the current pandemic? What are the sort of key features, do you think? I think there's a fundamental shift, not just in transport, but for the built environment, the, the industry of the built environment generally, which tends to historically focus on large pieces of infrastructure, but also they're, they're, they're designed to be permanent. And permanence is sort of celebrated in the, in the built environment. You know, it's like, ah, oh, the thing that somebody built 500 years ago, and isn't it amazing that it's still there, you know? Um, but one, one of the things that's changing or, or a feature of this phase of human evolution is there's a, there is a lot more uncertainty and we want to try and build in to our built environment actually less permanence and more maybe permanence in some senses, uh, but, but more flexibility, agility, how does the infrastructure actually respond to the city that it's trying to serve? Um, and the use of sort of data-driven and digital kind of thinking and tools and analysis enables us to do that in new ways. And that's starting to change. We're doing a lot of work at Arab now on agent-based modeling, uh, parametric modeling, you know, how do you test loads of different scenarios? How do you design something that can be, it can actually be designed to change? not designed to be immutable. Um, you know, how do you kind of use like a, a almost like a grid 
thinking. So you have a common floor plate, for example, in a building, and you can almost like Lego bricks, move things around, move the purpose of the building around. You know, we're still building railway stations that have uh, gate lines. Why do you need gate lines when your ticket's on your phone? And, you know, we have sensors that can read that you've got your ticket and it's all fine. Um, you know, why do we need a big hall where you wait to read the signs about when your train's leaving? Maybe we might like to have that, but we don't need to have it anymore because we've got it on our phones. Um, you know, so, so what a railway station is can be quite fundamentally rethought now. Uh, and, and, but people aren't quite ready for that. So how do you build a railway station of today, but anticipating that we might want to change it for tomorrow? So we're starting to see, you know, that coming forward. It's something that at Arab we're trying to, you know, sort of promote with clients. How do we think about creating resilient infrastructure, which means making it, you know, fundamentally flexible and almost like a living, uh, a living thing. Um, so I think that's one of the key elements. I think the other thing, for certainly if you look at the the London context, thinking about the 2050 work, um, you know, COVID sort of pushed people out into their neighborhoods and into the suburbs. And I think it's kind of shining a light again on this whole vexed question of what does it mean to invest in inner and outer London rather than central London, which has sort of plagued, you know, all the mayors that we've had because it's a huge area and where do you start and you can invest in a whole bunch of high streets and unless that's your high street you're not going to notice that it ever happened um so how, how do we kind of use the fact that people are currently spending more time in those areas throughout the day and and that will continue for quite a while i think and and harness that to actually find a different way of investing and i think you know the the direction that um sadiq's taken the cycling program, for example, which is more lightweight interventions, you know, with the, the wands rather than, you know, York Stone. At that time, that was, you know, what we were putting in place. And, and it was a huge step forward because it was segregated, which is, you know, what we want to see, but actually doing things that are more lightweight that can kind of come in, but also be taken out again if needed or be adapted. Uh, I think that's the way we're going to be able to kind of make some, um, you know, make our money go further, frankly, in the, in, across a much wider swathe of the city. Um, so smaller, um, smaller interventions, more widespread, but that's something for the industry is not very comfortable for a lot of people in the industry. You know, we'd rather build like one big cross trail than build a hundred small things, but actually what people want is the hundred small things. Um, or, you know, you need to find that balance. So that's going to be a challenge, I think, for the profet for the professions that are active within the industry is how, how do you kind of get excited and motivate yourself about the fact that you've had this sort of widespread inf impact uh, and, and when you've built something that's going to change over time. You know, and that's about kind of, again, putting the individual, the people that you're serving at the heart of what also makes you feel good about what you did at work every day. I think that's quite a big challenge for our, our whole industry. Yes, well, agility and flexibility are good messages of the future, aren't they? And I've always actually been astonished how easily uh, we've all adapted to these sorts of conversations on Zoom and doing things virtually, which we did physically in the past. So maybe we're more flexible uh, the, the, than we think as, as a society generally. So um, Isabel, thank you very much indeed for your insights. Thank you for uh, telling us about some Thanks. of your background in City Hall. Yep. And I look forward to uh, seeing you in Fitzrovia sometime soon. Yeah, thanks for having me.